So there was a little boy named Johnny. Johnny was large for his age. So people thought he was older than he was. But because Johnny was large for his age, his movement was clumsy, and because he couldn't pronounce words as clearly uh, as other children his size, kids and some adults poked fun at him. And because children are powerless, from the start, you could see that Johnny was being trained to see himself the way that other people saw him. They thought he was slow. He began to think he was slow. They thought he was uncoordinated. <coughs> he thought he was uncoordinated. They thought he was ugly. He thought he was ugly. All the Johnny came home unable to eat or to sleep often the actions of other people brought an innocent child to tears. Johnny's mother took him to his first Sunday school class. And that Sunday, the teacher, probably somebody like Faith, talked to the class about Jesus gathering people together and telling them that even though they might be poor, even though they might be hungry, even though things happen to them that might break their hearts and make them cry, they were special to God. In fact, they were more than special. They were blessed. Johnny didn't say much in that class. He'd been carefully trained by people not to draw attention to himself. No, never that. But his dark eyes shone as if they were reflecting the sun. When his mother came to the Sunday school class to retrieve him, she saw a lightness in his step that was not there before. Incredulous, she asked Johnny, Son, what did they tell you? What, what did you learn in Sunday school today? An awkward, clumsy, slow-talking Johnny stood up a little straighter, squared his shoulders back and looked at his mother and said, today we learned the, the, the beauty tunes. <laughs> the beauty tunes. All the word, although the word beatitude does sound a lot like you. This Latin word beatitude is translated from the Greek makario. What Beatitude actually translates to is happy or rich or blessed. These are the qualities that designate. Unlike the evangelist Matthew, the Greek physician turned evangelist Luke only lists four of the Beatitudes, but he moves them from the realm of metaphysics and philosophy to the gritty realm of the existential, to an actual state of being. Luke takes away the spiritual connotation. No, no, blessed are the poor in spirit. No. Luke says, rich, happy, and blessed are you that are really poor. Meaning that you have no money and no power. Luke's Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you that are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. No, he doesn't say that. No. Luke's Jesus says, happy, rich, and blessed are you that are actually starving and have cr cracked, dry, parched throats. Jesus goes on to say, you are happy, rich, and blessed when people hate you, when they exclude you, and when they insult you. Whoa, well, if that's the case, then Johnny was at the head of the list when it came to blessing. Why would Jesus say such a thing? People were begging in the streets and dying of starvation and malnutrition, just as they are now, just as you have prayed for them all during this worship service now. What is happy and rich and blessed about that? Then as now, being poor was seen by some to be an embarrassing, anxiety-ridden situation. She must not have lied herself. Oh, he probably got messed up with drugs. But their father was a loser, just like they are. They must be to blame for their own thing. In 2017, a study showed that for the first time since 2010, the number of people without a safe, regular place to sleep, 
the number of people who need a place like the food pantry outside our doors, the number of homeless people in America had grown. On any given night in 2017, nearly 554,000 people across the United States were homeless. An approximate 1% rise above 2016 levels. Was Jesus calling them rich, happy, and blessed? Why? As opposed to Matthew speaking beautiful sentences on the mountain, the Gospel of Matthew takes pains to say, Jesus came down to them and stood on a level place. Luke has Jesus talking to people on the plain where they could look him in the eye. One theologian says of Jesus standing face to face and looking at his listeners in the eye, Jesus must be on the level. What is even more interesting is that while the multitudes have come to hear Jesus, and Jesus is curing them of various diseases and even casting out demons. Jesus is not talking to the, to the multitudes. Jesus is talking to the disciples. Jesus is teaching them that as you compel people with the good news of Jesus Christ, know that God has a special love for the poor and the disadvantaged. Perhaps because of what the rich and the privileged in their negligence and insensitivity and greed have done to them. God is saying, of course the poor and hungry and the hated and the insulted and the excluded are blessed to me. They don't have anybody else but me. Remember that as you minister to them. Jesus' birth and Jesus' life and Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection means that all has been put in place for the complete salvation of the world. All things are ready, the old hymn goes. Christ is God's most decisive work regarding humankind. With Jesus, God's plan for universal abundance was put into place 2,000 years ago. Since God's plan for gathering all life back to God is finished, Luke's Beatitudes are a call to Christ's disciples to engage in right action for the good of the least of these, so that they too can be brought back into the plan of salvation that God has for everybody. Food for everybody. Plenty for everybody. Somebody to stop and help a person on the road. Everybody deserves that. Salvation means not only redemption. Salvation also means rescue and escape. Jesus says you fat cats sitting on disposable income who will not lift a finger to help those who are less fortunate, you are in mortal danger. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are well fed now. Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you because you are missing your limited opportunity to use your power and influence to make a difference in somebody's life. Because you choose not to, you don't want to get involved. You think that those who want to change things are moving too fast. How often have we heard that? Jesus looks at them sadly and says, you won't share? So how can there be a future for you as you are in the kingdom of God? An existence where everything is shared. I love the way you opened your children's message this morning and asking the kids, are you well fed? Did you get a lot of sleep? Do you have a place to live? Contrast that with people who don't. So does God require that in order to fulfill the promise of the Beatitudes that all of us have to sell everything that we have and give it to the poor? As Jesus showed the rich young ruler, God's love reaches out prejudicially toward the poor because their poverty violates God's intention for human life. Similarly, the rich find it difficult to experience God's sovereignty because their wealth turns them away from people in need and binds them and blinds them to their own need for salvation. As Jesus' disciples, Jesus directs the Beatitudes to us and reminds us in our plenty as the children were reminded today, to always be mindful of the poor, the hungry, the ones who are not included, 
The ones that hate it because they're slow or clumsy or have dyslexia or autism spectrum disorder or a myriad of other uniquenesses, including race and sexual orientation, that cause us to brand them, shut them out, and refuse to help them because they are other. The Jewish evangelist Matthew taught compassion but stressed righteousness. That's why he had Jesus sitting in the hills, because the hills represent the magnificence and the closeness of God, righteousness. The outsider, the Greek evangelist, Dr. Luke, come from a different culture and yet seeing himself included in the good news, taught righteousness, but stressed for all, no matter where they came from and who they were. The L.A. theatrical community is very small. Many of you know a guy by the name of Tom Shadiak. Tom Shadiak directed a few getaway movies that some of you may have heard of. Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, The Nutty Professor, and a little tiny film that I had a teeny tiny part in called Bruce Almighty. Tom made millions of dollars. At one point, I know that uh, his net worth was about $50 million. And if you would see Tom, and if you knew Tom, even as you were talking to him, he feels like a chameleon, doesn't he? When you talk to him, he's very sweet, he's very kind, but he always looks like he wants to get away and go to a hillside and contemplate and think and write and do worthwhile stuff. Tom always felt pulled in a direction differently from the one in which he was traveling. He felt empty of the fame and fortune he had acquired over the years, and that feeling of emptiness was only aggravated when in 2007 he was in a motorcycle accident and narrowly escaped uh, dying. He began to think more and more about his own mortality and what am I doing with the time I have here? For Tom Shadyak, the way to happiness uh, to a happy year of life lay in living a simpler lifestyle and sharing what he had with the less fortunate. So the $50 million that Tom Shadyak had, he gave most of it away. He traded his mansions and jets in for a mobile home on a bike. And he began sharing his wealth and his philosophy with the rest of the world. He remarked this year that this simple way of living has left him feeling truly happier and wealthier than he was when he lived in the fast lane in Hollywood. Tom said he was haunted by this mantra that kept traveling through his brain. He was plagued by this thought, I am part of divine essence. I don't have to become anything. I already am. We, just as we are, are part of divine essence, too. Jesus said the poor we will have with us always. And maybe Jesus said that because we are them and they are us. We are all part of divine essence. We are all loved by God. We are all part of divine essence. We are all we are not called to sell everything we have and give it away. We are called to always be in the process of giving, always giving to those who are less fortunate than we are, to Christ's church, and to the good of God's world. In finding our own location in the happy and rich and blessed arena of the beauty to us, in blessing each other, we find that we too are included in the blessedness of God. God is saying, Francis once prayed, where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Help us to remember that it is in giving we receive and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Thank you for blessing the poor, and pointing to them as the examples that we should follow. Help us to always be given. In your son's name we pray. Amen.